now you mentioned the Martin brothers for uh, under whose supervision the division actually occurred. We talk about the pillars of the breed. We are only mentioning as far as the pillars we mentioned Toronto we now to which male we can trace back literally every single male that's in the top positions these days. Every one of those dogs traces its lineage back to Quanto Vinarao. Then we had Marco uh, Celalan, who's not so popular in public opinion. People, a lot of people don't know, know about Marco. Uh, then we have Kanto and we have Mutz. Mutz has basically diminished the type you don't see because he didn't really produce his type. You see him both in the, some pedigrees of working lines as well. You see him, you know, they, people like to famously claim that Remo represents the Mutz line, which could be not even it's not even close to the truth it's not the mutz line just because he has him in the father side directly does not make him the mutz line it's uh would it be would it be would we be doing a disservice when we say just these three males are the pillars of the breed when we have a whole different population of dogs like we have which have severely been influenced by dogs like thrall from boz and nakhba shah and we have mink and other dogs like this that would also be regarded as the pillars of the breed not just these three males and we can argue Kanto had only 35 breedings and uh, was four class two. So would this dog be actually considered a pillar in the breed because he had such few breedings? There's other dogs that appear in many more pedigrees, much more heavily they're featured. Wouldn't be a better case to make those dogs. I'm not saying take something away from these dogs, but also add those dogs to address the real situation we have today in the entire breed. That's why maybe the working line people are so eager to say, oh yeah, it's two populations. The show dogs are another breed and we are another breed. Of course, we are specializing breeding for, let's say, a show picture. No, I wouldn't say anat correct anatomy. I would say more of a fancy show picture for dog fancy. And the other side is breeding more for drive. They're breeding more for speed. They're breeding, breeding more for power. And they're not looking so much to the overall picture. Yeah, as I, as I said, the pillars of the breed is hard, uh, for me, it's hard to describe. Um, it's um, the, 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 on the working line, we have these um, pillars you mentioned. Yeah, it's, um, and when you, when you look at the, I, I can only refer to the German population, but it's yes. almost half of the, the uh, we have, as to around about 9,000 puppies each year in the last year. And I would say around 4,000 is working line and 5,000 is show line. Sure. So um, when you have the, the working lines, they have their pillars. And um, they have nothing to do with Quanto Vina. Of course not. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, even if there would be a Quanto Vina, back there because in the 70s when Quanto Vina um, was a stud male, probably some of his offspring also went to the working line later on. Sure. Yeah. Nobody would consider Quanto Vina uh, a pillar of the working line breed, <laughs> I would say. Um, yeah, it's safe to assume that I would say. Yeah, so and um, when you go to the to the show lines, um, we have We have several. Uh, uh, we talk about bottleneck in the, the in the gene pool. I guess we had several bottlenecks so far. Yes. Yeah. Um, we we had the uh, for me that the, the the narrowest bottleneck definitely was Palme. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we had the two males out of Palme that did uh, a lot. F had a lot of effect on the breed, and uh, in the first years, all were, everybody was saying, "Oh, no breed on Parliament, no line breeding on Parliament." And um, once somebody started it and said, "Oh, that that looked fine. Let's do it." And then um, since then, we we had a mixture. And uh, if we we if we would do uh, a, a pedigree with ten. Um, ancestors, we would see how much line breeding we have in the back of our pedigree. Um, so the, the, that's probably one reason that genetics or bloodlines is not necessary anymore. 
because it's all so narrowly related that um, we are not we cannot sincerely discuss bloodlines um, when we have at least at fifth or sixth positions in the ancestors the same. That has nothing to do with bloodlines. When you look at one of the, the, the huge bloodlines that Lothar Kroll made every year, and yeah. uh, you see that there is one part to from from Horant, and then we have one huge outcome of so you can't dis sincerely discuss bloodlines anymore. It's absolutely uh, it, it, it's more and more the, the it's not genetics, it's exterior. And exterior is not only the, the, the anatomy, it's also the character, um, but it's what we what we see, we breed on what we see, not yeah. what we expect to have in, in the genes. Because genetics is, I would, I'm, I'm no genetic expert, but I would say if you ask a, gen, a, 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 a medician who is involved in genetics, he would say, it's all the same. Yeah, right, absolutely. It's essentially the same family. It's like saying my cousin is not related to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, so that, that brings us to the question of looking at pedigrees, looking at line breedings and solely basing decisions of line breedings. There was a very famous, now I keep bringing this back up where you mentioned Walter Martin. Now I can only think of the things he said. Uh, you mentioned Mr. Martin. He said a very famous, in a famous interview that you must look at the blood first. That was definitely a question when he was breeding. Yeah. When you're looking at the blood, you're looking at the feature of that bloodline or that pedigree, where those dogs are coming from. Now there is no need to look at the blood because literally every single dog has the same grandfather. You cannot find dogs that are away from Vegas to Hotman's Zad. Every single pedigree has this dog featured multiple times. And with the goods and bads that each dog brings, he brought his own. Uh, then you cannot, you for a certain period of time, you could not find dogs outside of Quenlueveg. And the goods and uh, bads, I mean, we don't need to, you know, discuss individual dogs, but those, do uh, those problems were a part of the breed. What we were doing always was trying to find short-term solutions, in my opinion, instead of looking at the big picture to go away and find the forgotten brothers and sisters of our dogs that were on the other side of the aisle that is now, you know, mentioned as the other breed, which was... We had bicolor VA dogs, we had uh, black VA dogs, we had uh, dogs with deep saddles and uh, tan bodies that were VA dogs back in the past. And today we see none of that. And those dogs would not even make a V rating today, some of those dogs, when that is the correct anatomy and to see the disparity between the anatomies of the quote unquote top dogs today and the trend that is going forward uh, versus the other population of the breed where they might not be all great dogs, but there are some excellent dogs on that side. And just the disparity is too high uh, where we cannot, you know, look sane when we say, okay, this is a view with the round, round top line and the excessive pronounced hind angulation and the extremely deep fronts with the short four legs with a really over pronounced head, over typified head. And also a dog on the other side that this is a V with long, uh, with not enough depth or substance in the chest. And then we have a uh, straight back, uh, not just the straight back, I'm not just talking about the thoracic back, but a straight lumbar back and a straight uh, sacral back where the dog has very good jumping potential, but the dog has a hard time in the trot when moving in the ring at a normal speed. Could you please uh, talk about that a little bit more from where we were to where we are in the anatomy of the dog, the extra exterior, as you put it. As you mentioned, uh... One important point um, when we when we describe a dog or when we when we read or listen to a description of a dog by a judge, we fairly often hear the phrase "straight back." And um, uh, my wife is a, is a veterinarian, and uh, she she comes from from horses. She had she had also a talented breeder. Also talented breeder of Jack Russell, yes, exactly. Um, but her basics were in, in the horses. And um, she, when the, the first time we, we met uh, and she went to the shows, she asked me, why is that called a straight back? 
because the, the, the back is curvy. And I said, yeah, you're, you're right. Why is it called straight back? I have no idea. That's what they say, straight back. And um, uh, recently I saw a, a, a picture um, where the, the angles of the, the top line were, um, were marked. And uh, you could see that in the, in the current um, top rated dogs, you, you find an, an angle from the withers to the end of the group that is so far away from what it should be um, that you ask yourself, why is this dog still phrased with a straight back? And um, everybody is talking about the, the, the over typization and the, the, the over angulation in the in the headquarters. I would say the, that the, the problem is the the back situation. When you have um, people um, looking for for a puppy, and they come to visit the litter, and if they have if they are not involved in, in sports or breeding, so they want a family dog and they come visiting and they say, oh, but I, I don't want those curvy dogs. I said, take a look. Oh, you have, you have a, a, a line that is not so curvy. And I said, well, um, it might look curvy to somebody, but probably they're not that curvy referring to others. But uh, it's, it's still, um, it's still a, a problem that we, we are promoting the dogs with the highest wither, with us you can, uh, you can imagine to the deepest layer of the group. And if you don't get away from that, then the, uh, the public will not accept where we are going with the breed. The diagrams we use to describe our dogs for 